So as we talk about biologically important molecules, now brings us to our nucleic acids. And we're going to be working with two sort of broad categories of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. And of course, you're probably already familiar with where the first letters come from. The D and the R come from the fact these molecules are composed of carbohydrates, a.k.a. sugars. And at the core of these molecules, we either have deoxyribose for DNA or ribose is the sugar for RNA. So ribonucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. So that's going to be the sugar backbone of our nucleotides. And these are our monomers. Remember, as we talked about the condensation reactions and the polymerizations, for the polymer nucleic acids, our monomers are going to be the nucleotides. So we've got our sugar. We're also going to have this phosphate group. Now, when we assemble our nucleic acids, there are going to be three of these phosphates. So guess what one of our nucleotides is that we're going to assemble into DNA and RNA that we also use for all the energy in our body? ATP. And what does the T stand for? Triphosphate. So the energy we use for our body is stored in the bonds of those phosphates, but we're going to need all of those so that one can remain attached, and that phosphate is going to connect to the next sugar, and so on and so on, and that's how we're going to link them together. We'll see that in just a second. But in addition to the sugar and the phosphate, we're also going to have this nitrogenous base because we see the nitrogens present. <coughs> now, we already know the four bases, and we've already gone through this. I always remember them in their pairs. You're always going to hear A and T together and C and G together. So when I think of nucleotides, A, T, C, G. That's how I remember them. But they're not exactly the same because they're two groups of nucleotides. Some have a rather small ring-like structure, whereas others have a larger two-ring type structure. So these are the purines and the pyrimidines. Now, the way I remember which is which, purine is a smaller word than pyrimidine. And I just keep in mind that the structure is the opposite of the number of letters. So purine name is small. That means these are the purines with the bigger structure. And the others are the opposite. Pyrimidines are the smaller ones. Now, that's however it works for you. You go ahead and do it. But now we have to remember which are the purines, A and G, and which are the pyrimidines, T and C. We'll talk about the U out here in a second. And again, whatever mnemonic you have to do to make that work, you do that. So in DNA, we have A, T, C, G. But in RNA, we don't have one of these bases. We have, it's replaced with uracil. Uracil also being a pyrimidine. Can anyone guess or does anyone know which DNA base is not present in RNA? Hmm? T. The T, and that's why they have these lined up. You'll see them illustrated like this. The C is present in everything. The T is only in DNA, and the uracil is only in RNA. So here's how I remember which is which. I love watching Discovery Channel shows about Egyptian culture and the building of the pyramids. And they had to hand cut those blocks, those big, huge, several ton blocks of limestone and granite, and then move them into place, right? Right? So you had to cut blocks to build pyramids. Cut pyramids. C-U-T, pyrimidine. You see? So the nucleotides, cytosine, uracil, 
thymine cut goes with the pyramid pyrimidine. And if you remember that, then the others are the purines. So again, that's how I try to keep those straight in my mind. Because as you pair these in the building up of DNA, you're going to always place a purine with a pyrimidine. A and T, C and G. You're never going to put two purines together and you're never going to put two pyrimidines together because two of the pyrimidines will be too small to reach across the space and the two purines will be too big to fit in that space. That's why you have to have one of each in that pairing. So again, a little bit more detail about what's going on here. We talk about our nucleotide bases. Here's just sort of a word for trivia for your own edification. A nucleoside is going to be the base, the sugar, with the phosphate removed. That, that's the only difference. We're going to focus more on the nucleotides, and often we'll refer to them as nucleotide triphosphates. You're going to see this a bunch because the vast majority of what we do in cell biology and all of the molecules and all of the organelles that we build up are really to lay the foundation and to protect and facilitate these two processes. Are these the most important processes? No, but they are very, very important. Those processes being transcription and translation. So we have our nucleotide DNA. We are going to transcribe that nucleotide code into a copy, RNA, and specifically messenger RNA, because we have to get that code out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm where we can assemble it along with a ribosome, which we're going to talk about later today. And with that code, we know the proper sequence to assemble the primary sequence of our protein. So what is the primary sequence of our protein that we talked about yesterday? Somebody just simply define what is the primary sequence of a protein. The amino acid sequence, all right? The specific sequence of the amino acids in a protein is its primary structure. We can fold that up a little bit with a helix or a sheet. That's secondary. What is the tertiary? 3D, the 3D structure. And what is quaternary? Okay, I'm hearing a couple of different things. What is the quaternary? More than one protein together. More than one protein put together is the quaternary structure. So all of that has to go through transcription and translation before we can even start talking about protein structures at all. So this is just a reminder of our nucleotide. It can be simply the nucleoside with no phosphate at all, or we can have one phosphate, two phosphate, three phosphate. A lot of times we see our single phosphate molecule in a cyclical form. We'll talk about cyclic AMP or CAMP as a signaler within the cytoplasm of a cell. There's our uh, ATP, we usually think of that as the energy store of the cell, which it is, but we're also going to use that in the building up of our nucleotide. Now think back yesterday, condensation reaction. You put monomers together, assemble them into polymers, but what was one of the really important concepts of how you assemble monomers into polymers. Hmm? Okay, water's liberated. That's the condensation reaction. But as far as how, not the mechanics, but the assembly process, how do you put the monomers into the polymers in the right order? I guess that's the directionality. That's critical. And when we look at our assembly of our nucleotides into our DNA polymer. We're going to have one of these condensation type reactions. But notice we have a directionality. 
as we look at the carbons within our nucleotides, there's going to be a what is referred to as the five prime carbon, kind of sticking up on that little stick. There's the three prime carbon that's on that corner of the nucleotide. So the order in which our DNA is assembled and the directionality in which we read our DNA sequence is always said to be five prime to three prime. Just like in our proteins, we had amino terminus and our carboxy terminus. Here with our DNA, we have a five prime that is on the left. That's just convention. We read left to right, so that's how we think of DNA sequence. Five prime end is on the left, three prime end is on the right. And so as our enzymes assemble monomers into polymers, they have to assemble them in the right direction, and they're going to assemble them in the right sequence. And when we get to DNA replication and transcription at the end of this semester, we're going to see how that's accomplished. But right now, we're just sort of putting together the pieces of how DNA looks. And we're, again, we're starting simple and building up and building up more complex. So if I were to point at this nucleotide, is that a purine or a pyrimidine? Pyrimidine, why? Little structure, big word. See, you don't have to make it hard. Little structure, big word. That's it. I think some people try to make this stuff too complicated. Look at how they're put together. We have the A and the T put together. We have one strand, and remember, we got the backup strand, the good one in the backup. What is holding our two strands together? Hydrogen bonds, strongest or weakest? Weakest, weakest of the bonds. Because we're going to have to unzip the two strands, which is a great analogy because you've got the two teeth of a zipper and you unzip them to separate them. That's what's going to happen with our DNA. And even though we're not going to really talk a lot about it now, I want to go ahead and introduce you to the concept that you see the hydrogen bonding is not equal. How many hydrogen bonds between the AT pair? Two. How many between the CG pair? So what do we know about the more bonds you have and the energy required to break that bond? More bonds takes more energy. So more bonds, that connection is stronger. So I think you can see that when we're working with our DNA or nucleic acid in general, when you have a lot of CG sequences together in the sequence, it's going to take more energy to separate those sequences. A lot of A and T's together, it's going to be easier. And again, that comes more into play when you're doing molecular biology in a lab. And we'll talk more about the hydrogen bonds down the road. <clears throat> now again, we introduced this concept earlier. Again, just a reminder here, and we'll expand on her story more. But Watson and Crick discovered the 3D arrangement, the double helical shape of DNA. But they wouldn't have done that without this. That is actually an X-ray X-ray diffraction picture of the structure of pure DNA. This is what was stolen off of Rosalind Franklin's desk. They, they, they weren't doing it thinking that, oh, I'm going to commit a crime and steal this. It's just the professor thought she was his technician instead of another professor because that's how females were viewed back in the day. And so he took this, showed it to these two guys, and they got the Nobel and became famous. It was only, I think, 10 years after they won the Nobel did it really come out that Rosalind Franklin was as much a part of the discovery as they were. Unfortunately, she had already been deceased. What is the x-ray of again? This is pure DNA. Okay. You have this pure DNA, you bounce x-rays off of it, and some people can look at this thing and understand that structure. I'm not that smart. But I will never forget that picture because in my doctoral work, that was, an, that was an exam question. What is this an x-ray diffraction map of? I had never seen it before in my life. Have you ever done that? See a question and you haven't even studied it? You don't even know it's there? And you go, mm, I don't know, an ear. I, you know, I forget what it is. I can't leave stuff blank. 
That's why I'll never forget that. Cool thing is, in Illinois, they have Rosalind Franklin University. And as you look at the logo for Rosalind Franklin University, you recognize that? That's where they get it from her original x-ray diffraction map showing the double helical nature of DNA. So proteins, nucleic acids, one of my favorite groups we get to discuss now, carbohydrates. You know why it's one of my favorite groups? It's a big component of chocolate. I love chocolate. Figured that out, right? Carbohydrates, the monomers of carbohydrates, it's really cool, monomer, monosaccharide. Just, and we refer to them often as simple sugars. We can have disaccharides. Guess how many that is? Two. Two. Man, y'all are smart. Oligosaccharides. Oligo meaning few is short chains of sugars versus our polysaccharides. Poly means many. Glycogens, starch, chitin, cellulose. Those are going to be some of our polysaccharides. The only difference is the number of monomers that make these up. But again, most people just going to say straight up sugar. That's what we're talking about. So if we look at our simple sugars, monosaccharides, we're going to see that we can have some hexose sugars, glucose, mannose, fructose. What is hexose? Hexagon? Six. So in glucose, there are six carbons. And those six carbons are going to be important when we get to the Krebs cycle when we have to keep up with our numbers and accounting of our carbons. Penta, how many is Penta? Five. Five. Five carbon sugars. Ribose, wait, we just talked about that one. Where did we hear ribose? RNA, that's the foundational sugar of RNA. Ribose, ribulose, and xylose. Xylose, sorry. You can either illustrate them as a straight chain in their structure, but more often you're going to see them in their ringed form. Again, you can see how the carbons are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and there's our 6 carbon. That's typical of what we have with glucose. That's the structure of glucose. Disaccharides, two of them. We use a lot of disaccharide every single day, and we may not even know it. But when we link through a condensation reaction two monosaccharides together, we get this O linkage, we're going to liberate the water. And for carbohydrates, this linkage is called a glycosidic bond. Glyco always refers to sugar. And when we think of our most common disaccharides, we have maltose, lactose, and sucrose. We're probably most familiar with lactose, especially if you have a problem with lactose, which we say people that do are what? Lactose intolerant. So where's lactose come from? Milk, dairy products is where we got to get a lot of lactose. Have you ever heard of sucrose? Sucrose is our favorite. Table sugar. And when you look at the monosaccharides that make up sucrose, it's glucose, which is a monosaccharide, and fructose. Those two together make up sucrose. Lactose is glucose and another monosaccharide called galactose. So these are our common disaccharides. Polys, I've already talked about a lot of those. Starch in plants, glycogen for animals, and then our structural polysaccharides, cellulose, chitin in the bugs, and bacterial cell walls, they're also going to have a polysaccharide composed of glucose carbohydrates that support the bacteria. So carbohydrates, they just, they just don't taste good. And you do realize, of course, that carbohydrates, since we use glucose, contain a lot of what? What, is, what do carbohydrates contain a lot of that we want to use and liberate from glucose? ATP, so energy. The chemical bonds of those hydrogen carbons, did I say hydrogens? 
I just invented a whole new word. The chemical bonds of carbons, when you break those chemical bonds, that releases the energy that our metabolic pathways capture and store as ATP. So this is just a little illustration showing our glucoses linked together, threaded together, woven together in these fibrils, packed together in the cell walls of plants to hold the whole tree up. That kind of blows my mind. All right, fourth group, biologically important molecule, the lipids. We don't really like lipids, do we? What, typically when we don't like these things, what do we call them? Fats, just fats. We don't like fat. What, what is fat good for, really? We don't, we don't like it. Fat's bad, like pain is bad. But in fact, lipids are essential. You, you can't live without lipids. And honestly, fats are good things. So as we look at lipids, we're going to see that lipids are basically what kinds of molecules composed of carbons and hydrogens. They are carbons and hydrogen, hydrocarbons. Right, they're just hydrocarbons. Y'all make it too hard. It's like, well, it can't be that easy. Yeah, it really is. Hydrocarbons. And since we have carbons and hydrogens that are not polar, that are not charged, we say what kind of chemical property do hydrocarbons have? Hydrophobic. They don't really interact with water or other charged or other polar molecules. And when we look at our lipids, especially if we put phospho in front, where are you going to find a lot of these? Cell membranes. Membrane-bound organelles. So we have to have lipids or we really aren't going to have cells. But we also need lipids for energy storage, which is sort of weird because we already store glucose. It has energy as glycogen. Why would we want to store energy as fat? And, it, and an, interesting, an interesting thing about fat, and really our fats are going to be stored as triglycerides, by the way. Gram per gram, there's more energy stored in a gram of fat than there is in a gram of carbohydrate. Because it has to do with the energy between the carbon bonds. In glucose, there's only six carbons. In triglycerides, there may be upwards of 20 carbons. So in a general sense, one gram of sugar has about four calories, but one gram of triglycerides, one gram of fat, is going to have about nine. So you, you get twice or more energy per gram. I don't know about you, I like getting more for my money. But in the case of fat, I don't know if that's a good thing. Because we usually don't care for it. But it's essential to help us survive. So our types of lipids, we've already talked a lot about phospho and glycolipids. Uh, the triglycerides are our fat storage, the fatty acid chains on the end of our phospholipids. And we're going to look at steroids. Now, st steroids, that's hormones, right? Well, guess what? Your steroid hormones are made from cholesterol, which is a lipid. So you can't do without lipids. You can't live without fats. So here, here's a basic concept that we all need to understand about lipids and their structures. When you look on the foods that you buy and you look at the percent of fat contained in a particular food, you're going to see a couple of different categories. You're going to see a percent of calories from saturated fats. What in the world does saturated mean? When you look at the carbons in yellow, how many bonds can one carbon atom have? Four. Four. So let's look at this carbon, for instance. It's bonded to that carbon. It's bonded to an adjacent carbon. That's two. Only two left, right? And it's got the two little white hydrogens. Can that carbon bond to anything else? No. What about that one? That one? That one? They're all full. They all are filled with single bonds. And when you have single bonded lipids, or in this case, 
fatty acid chains, hydrocarbon chains, these chains are straight. Now, as we get into pro, uh, membrane structure and membrane composition, we're going to see that this straight nature can have an effect on the physical properties of a membrane or that layer. Now, can carbons only have single bonds? What else, what else can they do? Double, triple, yeah, pretty much everything. Well, if we throw a couple of double bonds in, just a few, now we've got some carbons that aren't saturated with single bonds. You see where we get this now? So now we're talking about unsaturated fat. Now let's go another level. What if we threw a bunch of double bonds? What would be a good prefix for a lot? Polysaccharides. So you have a bunch of double bonds, and I don't know the number is two saturated and three poly. I don't know where we go from just being saturated to poly unsaturated. But having many hydrogens missing so you fill them with double bonds, that's the poly unsaturated fat. Now the trans, we'll get into that a little bit later. The trans is this artificial mechanical thing that we invented that's really, really bad for you. But we change the whole position of these things and really mess it up and your body doesn't know a lot of what to do with that. So here is again a visual representation. You're not going to have to remember structures, okay? But we've got our fatty acid chains which are really just our hydrocarbon chains. We can form triglycerides by taking a glycerol group and three of our fatty acids linking them together. There's our triglyceride. We have our phospholipids which can have many different forms, but the key here is you've got the hydrogen, the hydrocarbon chains, you have the, the group that has a phosphate attached to it, hence phospholipid. And then we've got our steroids, our sterols, if you will, cholesterol being one, and then we're going to convert from cholesterol, we can convert into our steroid hormones. So again, all those can be classified in our groupings of phospholipids. This is just another example where you've got this phosphoglyceride group that can have a number of different things sticking on the ends that are polar, serine, choline, phosphatidylcholine is going to be used a lot in signaling that we're going to get to. Phosphatidyl inositol is also used in signaling. Again, another type of phospholipid. But lipids are extremely diverse. Lipids are almost as diverse as proteins. And we're going to ascribe a lot of those functions as we go through the chapters. Right now, we're just pouring all the Legos out on the floor and sorting them out. You know how you do that before you build stuff? That's what we're doing in these first couple of chapters, putting the building blocks on the floor. So here are our categories. I just love the Amoeba Sisters. So here are categories of biological molecules. You can see our monomers, the polymers, and we've talked about how they're assembled and some of their importance as we go through and now begin to build up the functional units of our cells.